this touch point, this 35 minute conversation is so much more intimate than a blog post, which says exactly the same things as well. So I think that's another reason why we as humans like it is because we're used to stories. We're used to hearing people talk and conversations. Welcome to Marketers Talking Marketing, the most SEO title podcast there is. Today we are talking podcast with Mark from Speak On Podcast. Wait, did I get that right? Speak On Podcast? Yeah, it says okay. it does exactly what it says on the tin. Wonderful. So uh, podcast, I mean, this is very meta because we're on a podcast talking about podcasting. Why should marketers in 2023 care about podcasting? Great question, Jess. I think the simplest answer is that it's the easiest way to create content hands down the easiest way to create content. So that could be internal content from conversations that you have internally, if you've got a large company, or it could be from external conversations with ideal customers or prospects and also customers of your own. You can just have a conversation, which we're all used to doing. It doesn't take any training. We know how to talk normally. Um, I think there's sometimes a little bit more pressure when it is a podcast and it's being recorded. Um, you feel like you might have to perform a little bit. But I wish that podcasting was a thing when I used to work in uh, data center design and build marketing, where I knew oh. nothing about data centers and how to design and how to build them. But what I would have loved to have done is spoken to the designer, spoken to the air conditioner person, spoken to the water and heating person, and just collated all of that content and then repurposed it into written formats as well, like uh, blogs, newsletters, etc. Um, so I think if people, uh, if marketers start seeing podcasting as their genesis for content um it makes it makes absolute sense to to start a podcast yeah that's a great point too because i am guessing that there are people who are watching this clip right now in the future and they are not watching it on the podcast they're watching it on linkedin tiktok yeah. some other social media platform on that side yeah yeah we we ran some uh well we tr we tried to get the most amount of content out of one interview just as an experiment and I managed to create 40 different pieces of content just from wow. one 35 minute conversation. So uh, the 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 potential that it has to really up your content um, production and as well as, of course, you've got to distribute it and still work hard on that. Um, but it really is a game changer. Uh, if you are a CEO watching this, please do not ask your marketer to produce 40 pieces of content from every single podcast. Let's not <laughs> set that expectation. <laughs> uh, but that is awesome. So how did you how did you go from marketing data center architecture to podcasts? Yeah, wow. Okay, so we'll, we'll step back a little bit. So uh, I've always worked in B2B sales and marketing, uh, mainly for software companies. So um, I was working in, in that role as a digital marketing manager because they're Digital marketing was a new thing back then. That was the title that, that we got given. And that was literally do everything that is to do with online. Uh, that was my remit. And I actually uh, implemented HubSpot CRM uh, in that role. Love HubSpot. And uh, me Love too. HubSpot. And these were the days that HubSpot were just educating people about inbound marketing. They weren't as famous as they were, uh, as they are now. Um, but what it gave me was a unique skill that I had experience of implementing HubSpot and their CRM and marketing automation platform for a company. So my next role, I was pretty much hired so I could do that. Um, then that company that I was working with, they got acquired. Um, so um, they were being rolled up into a much larger organization. And the role just wasn't going to be the same for me. So I got another job where my first priority was to implement HubSpot and have HubSpot uh, marketing working with Salesforce. So I got very good at that implementation, the tech side of thing, building out the tech stack, making all the automations, uh, using Zapier to, to automate as much as I could. Um, and I took a year break where I went traveling for um, six months to South America and six months in Southeast Asia. But whilst I was away, I was thinking, what am I going to do next? And this is really where my um, kind of entrepreneurial journey starts. Um, I decided to be a MarTech consultant where I could plug anything together, implement any CRM with any tool, uh, and I did that for about two years. Um, and then one of the clients that I had whilst I was doing that um, asked if I wanted to join their company, which was a lead research and data enrichment service, which was a productized service with 100 people all over the world. Um, and I jumped at the opportunity to be a general manager for them, so running pretty much everything. So it got me more into, uh, into the, the leadership role, more into sales as well. Um, and then after a year of working there, I kind of did everything that I wanted to do for the business. Um, and I was looking for my next opportunity. And um, as I was sharing with you just, just before, I started to pitch myself on podcasts and saw success with it. 
tested that out with a few other people, friends of mine, pitched them, got them on shows. And then I thought, okay, maybe there is a need for this in the market. I could serve more people if I built an agency. Um, and then fast forward two and a half years and we're talking here today. Yeah, I love it. I think the hardest part for so many people is starting. And how do I how do I get on a podcast? How do I get guests for a podcast? You're like, where do there's so much to do? Where do I even start with it? So definitely feels like you're bringing a a service to market that solves like an immediate need that people have. Yeah, definitely. And when I look at podcasting, I think there's three main plays or three main strategies that you can take. So the first is the obvious one: start your own podcast. Um, that's great if you've got the time, the resources. There's a lot of energy that goes into. Uh, turning up you were saying that you uh did a daily podcast which uh would lead yes. to burnout um, yes. that's, that's a lot a, it was a great time don't regret it but kind of regret it <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh you've got the editing process and of course the distribution and growth of that podcast as well personally i think that um starting your own podcast is great if you've got a relatively small total addressable market and you've got quite a high price product because it's a great touch point that you can create as part of your marketing strategy to use that, not only to start conversations with prospects, but also to use as sales enablement content as well. So first strategy, start your own podcast. The second strategy is speaking on other people's podcasts. Uh, that's what we specialize in at Speak On Podcasts. And really what you get to do there, and the reason why I love this one is you get to leverage somebody else's audience. They've worked hard, the podcast host has worked hard to build that audience. They've vet the guests that come on their show. And they often do a lot of the, the distribution and promotion of that podcast as well. And it's very, let's go back to HubSpot, for example. It's like going to inbound HubSpot's conference. And rather than doing the keynote speech where you're going to speak to 13,000 marketers, you're actually in the little side room, which is talking about how to implement product analytics and use that with HubSpot. But those 100 people that are in that room are 100 people that are really interested in product analytics. Yeah. That's just a fictional example, but if I was a product analytics company or service, I want to be in that room, not not the big room with 13,000 broad marketers as well. So if you look at podcast guesting as a way to laser focus on your niche audience and then just constantly turn up in front of them, um, I can't remember the stat off the top of my head, Jess, but if somebody listens to one podcast, they're likely to listen to other podcasts as well. And as more people turn to podcasting to learn about what's happening now, rather than um, reading books, because you read a book now that was produced two years ago and TikTok may, may not have even made it into the book. Um, so yeah. podcasting is a great way to, to get that current information and, and learn from. And that's where I believe a lot of even B2B marketers are, are turning to to learn themselves. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, the The leg that there is between cutting, I'm going to call it not even cutting edge, but like the new meta for advertising. So LinkedIn, uh, conversation ads have been popping off. Conversation ads are not going to be seen in any books or especially any course material at college or universities for years. And by the yeah. time they do make it into that printed material, they're old news, right? They're not as relevant. So, I mean, I agree. The podcast Mark referenced Pavel Konoplenko, who is the first guest I ever had on the podcast. Him and I had a daily podcast for like nine months. Monday through Friday, we would cover three new marketing news topics every day. And I think where we had a decent audience and we had a lot of engagement, but what we did not do is we did not repurpose that content at all. Mm -hmm. It lived in the podcast form. I think we had a website where we would put each episode into, but we didn't do blog posts from it. We didn't cut it up. And going back, if I did it again, I would have produced all that content for yeah. it because it, it definitely changes the, I think, the consumption and the value you get from that content you've produced if you're not repurposing it for other uses. Like, make it once, use it as many times as you can. Definitely. Yeah. I, I think as well, it's become a lot easier to repurpose content now with tools like Subly and Feed and Descript is a great tool as well to use that you can edit on the go and, and create snippets. Um, and, and obviously, you know, that was 10 years ago. So social media has come a long way. Um, you wouldn't normally see uh, people posting business stuff to business people on Instagram, whereas now you would. Um, but funny you should say that about um, strategies and tactics. So I, I studied marketing or business studies and marketing Back in 2005, 2009, is when I was at uni, all they said about uh, online marketing is that websites are going to become important and there's this important and there's this thing called Facebook. That was yeah. it. So I bought this book, if you can see, The Dummy's Guide to Web oh, Marketing. Yeah. 
It's 700 pages. It's meaty. And I went through cover to cover and just tried to implement as much as I could. And that was really my education in, in online marketing. Yeah. Oh, man. I've taken one marketing course and it was in graduate school in 2020. And I remember we had a handout and there was a chart on there and the data was it was a social media platform by popularity. And it had struck me because I think Pinterest was super high on it and a few other ones. And I was like, oh, the, and Google, Google Plus was still listed. I was like, eh, I don't know about this. And I looked in like the little date, the little you know footnote said it was from like 2016. Right. And I was like, this yeah. is four years old. <laughs> like this is yeah, especially so when relevant. They're, they're reporting on like daily, um, monthly active users yeah. and like to show data yeah. from four years before is just yeah. it's I bonkers. Mean, but yeah. Twitter this week compared to last week is a different world. Yeah, hundred percent. So, uh, just just before I lose my train of thought, the third strategy with speaking with podcasts um, is to advertise on podcasts. And there's many ways that you can advertise on podcasts. So it could be that the host reads out more like an advertorial, um, or it could be that you have like a voice actor or a professional voice actor who reads your um, your advert, or it could be you uh, reading out. However, I consume a lot of podcasts. I think I've consumed 17 days worth of podcasts in 2022. I got my kind wow. of year in review. I listen to them when I'm working out, when I'm working sometimes. Um, uh, so yeah, any any opportunity I can, I listen to them. But of all of my favorite podcasts that have adverts, I love the button that skips 45 seconds because I can just skip through the advert that comes in mid-roll for halfway through the interview. I love the shows. I tune into, I listen to every interview that goes live on their shows, but I skip, skip, skip. Um, and I think that's what most people do. Um, so I don't think podcast advertising is as effective unless you are um, a B2C brand and you need large reach, then going sponsoring some of the larger podcasts may make sense because there will be a percentage of that audience who do listen to the podcast. But yeah, so the three strategies there. It, it reminds me of uh, YouTube advertising where it's going to be NordVPN, mm -hmm. <laughs> another yeah. VPN, or Caseify. <laughs> like yeah. those are the uh, three. I, I pay you for YouTube Premium and uh, people are like, why? Why'd you do it? But I have YouTube on. I listen to a lot of music whilst I work with YouTube. Okay. And I I don't even know what adverts are on YouTube these days because you, you pay, I think, £12 a month for about $15. But for the amount I consume, I believe it's worth it. And uh, I don't see any ads on on, uh, on YouTube. Yeah, I uh, I love advertising. So there used to be a plugin for a Chrome extension that you could use on Facebook. It only lasted about three weeks in the marketplace before Facebook destroyed it. And it would allow, it was called Big Big Ads. Mm -hmm. And it would allow you to actually only have advertisements in your newsfeed. No way. <laughs> yeah. And so I would, I would always use it to go and see what people were doing and what they're at. This was before you had Media Gallery and on LinkedIn being able to go see people's posts. But um, do you think that, so the three tips you gave, are there ones that map to certain company stages or marketing maturity stages versus others? Yeah, it is like any advice in marketing or in sales. It really does depend on where you are in your journey and um, and, and what your objectives are as well. Um, speaking on podcasts isn't a direct lead generation strategy. So if your objective is to generate leads, there are probably other things that you should be doing, like outbound sales, could be advertising, pay-per-click advertising, for example. Um, if you're looking to focus on building that brand awareness or you have something that you need to educate the market on, then speaking on podcasts or having your own podcast can be a really good channel to do so. And again, you're leveraging other people's audiences, especially if you're speaking other, on, on other shows. And if I go back to that example of the product analytics company, you just want product folks who are interested in analytics. And if there's five shows, which is all about product analytics, and it might be by amplitude and mixed panel, you know, some of the big players in the industry, you get to go on their show and share your message with, with that audience as well. So... Speaking on podcasts, I would say if you've got a large total addressable market and a low price product, that's the, that's the strategy I believe you should start with. If you have a, a small total addressable market and a high price product, then start your own podcast and use that as a way to start conversations with prospects. Then if you have a huge TAM total addressable market and a relatively low um, average deal size, then perhaps advertising on podcasts would be the right strategy for you. Again, uh, it's really hard to give a silver bullet answer with so many variables, yeah. but that's what I've seen across all of the customers that we've worked with. 
Awesome. Is there anything that would be, is there any reason not to look at podcasting? Yeah, if, if you don't like them, um, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those, if, if you're not uh, comfortable speaking on a regular basis um, and you don't have something interesting to say, I would argue that most people have something interesting to say. They just don't realize. Oftentimes what's obvious to you is, uh, is amazing to others. So just because you've said it over and over again doesn't mean that somebody um, has heard that and they also um, say it as much as you do as well. Um, there is There are some times where it can be quite tricky. So there was a potential customer that came to us who were a metal injection molding company wanting to go after engineers at these specific power and energy plants. And I said to them, I don't think podcasting is right for you. Um, if, if you were going to look at podcasting, the one option might be to start your own podcast. But I don't know much about um, electrical engineers and whether they tune into podcasts uh, themselves. So maybe explore a different channel that might uh, yield a better result. And in that case, it might be trade publications and trade magazines because those may be more popular with that audience. So like with any marketing advice, Jess, as you know, it's um it's spend time on the channels where your prospects are if your prospects aren't listening to podcasts that you can tell then probably it's not the right channel for you i have a really interesting not b2b example so graham stefan has a a podcast a video podcast actually and he had on a woman who goes by the name of kazumi who's actually an only fans girl okay and she makes three hundred thousand dollars a month on only fans and when discussing, right, yeah. when discussing how do you grow to that large of an account, I think she did some really, really novel things from the marketing standpoint. But she said for her, the game changer was podcast. So she would start to go on podcasts and she would just be herself and uh -huh. talk about whatever the topic of the hour was. It was mainly what I would call like lifestyle podcast. But going on podcast was what really accelerated her OnlyFans success. What up? Oh, that was so unexpected and uh, definitely something that I, I wouldn't think has a direct correlation, uh, but it was like the game changer for her. That's it awesome. Was, yeah. Yeah. It was a, it's an insane amount of money to make <laughs> Yeah. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. And attributing podcasts is like the main success point for it. Definitely not a B2B to B to B model, but you know, who knows? Maybe someone considers themselves the the only fan star of their industry in an, in an appropriate adult way. This is going to get trimmed down drastically <laughs> <Okay. laughs> with that example. But I thought it was so interesting. That is super um, interesting. A lot of companies are really still leaning into ABM. And I'm assuming if you're trying to target those, like you mentioned, they're trying to get in front of engineers at specific companies. It could be a challenge without someone else helping ensure, you know, discoverability that that content's getting in front of them on that standpoint. So I definitely see where that would be an mm -hmm. exclusionary experience. <laughs> I don't know if that's a real word as I said it. Um, do you have, do you have like some favorite, so someone is listening to our podcast right now and they're saying, I want to go start my own podcast. Do you have any like recommended tips on where to start tools you love platforms? Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm always keen to share advice, which is the most not basic advice, but the least path of resistance. So what do you need equipment wise? Buy a microphone, a hundred dollars off Amazon. Not going to say which microphone, but if you spend a hundred dollars on the microphone, you'll get a decent enough microphone to start. Don't use your AirPods. Uh, Jess and I were speaking yeah. about that before. Um, from a camera point of view, um, again, I was sharing with Jess that I'm just using my, um, my actual phone. I've got an iPhone 12, I think a couple of years old now. Um, and it uses the camera on the back there and a, an app called Camo, which is $40. So your startup costs are $150, assuming that you already have a relatively new phone. Um, and then keep it simple when it comes to uh, recording. You can use Riverside or you can use Zoom. Most people ha already have a Zoom account, so just use Zoom. When it comes to editing, um, if you do a conversational style uh, interview, I think there's less need to do the editing. Um, and one of the things that you, I recommend that people do is that they do a pre-interview call with most of their guests before that interview happens and just have a little bit of structure, have an agenda here. Are, here's how we're going to start. Here's the meat of the uh, interview. I usually ask these three to eight questions or five to eight questions, whatever it might be. Um, and at the end, we're going to wrap up with um, a couple of quick fire questions and a summary. 
uh, and give that to the guests before they come on and that helps remove some of the um, anxiousness that people might have at least they know what the flow of the conversation is going to be as well um so i think jess i, I can pause there but i think that is yeah. a very lean way of starting with a podcast yeah and i again i am so impressed at how great your video looks that i was surprised that you're going on an iphone but it makes sense cameras today have you know compared to digital cameras of 10 years ago yeah <laughs> any yeah. cell phone today is beating that um i also say the more you do it the easier it is i think I, I went back and looked at my my first episode i recorded for this series and i was like oh man i was rough <laughs> it's not yeah. smooth so yeah. and i think there i recommend anyone who is thinking about getting into podcasting do it you know worst case you have some great conversations with people that you may have not spoken to before a lot, a lot of our customers actually start by speaking on podcasts to see if they like the medium, if they enjoy the process, if they enjoy the conversation and connections that they make. And then they go on to decide to build their own podcast or to, to launch their own podcast as well. We don't do any podcast production, but we've got a few friends who are uh, partners of ours now that will refer people to once they're ready to start producing their own show. Because, you know, you might do 10 hours of interviews and think, this completely drains me. I have no energy after a call like this. And uh, this is not something that I think is sustainable and that I want to continue doing. So it's a personal preference as well. Yeah. So if people are interested in working with you to get booked on podcasts, what's the next step for them? Yeah, sure. They can visit speakonpodcast.com uh, and book a call with uh, Patrick, who will be able to talk about the different strategies, understand whether speaking on podcasts is the right thing for you as a guest, depending on your objectives. Um, and we've got a really, really simple onboarding process, which is just one short form, an onboarding call, and we do all of the magic behind the scenes. Awesome. And we'll put your your URL and links in the show notes below. And if you guys are going to start a podcast, send it over to me. I want to listen to it. I'll be your number one fan. Thank you for joining us, Mark. Thank you for joining us on the show today. And everyone have a great rest of your day. Cheers, Jess. Really enjoyed the chat. Thank you.